What kind of position is a wife in when she comes in to hear her child screaming, the cat at the filch and the dog at the high, her loaf burning on the hearth, her calf suckling, her pot boiling over, and her husband complaining? This is a passage from the Halle Medved, or A Letter on Virginity, a medieval English document that acts as a really handy list for the sort of housework that women would be expected to do. But all of these chores are chores that they come in to do from somewhere else. Where's that somewhere else? Their jobs. Medieval women worked. To get an idea of what kind of jobs were available for your average medieval woman, 80% of whom would have belonged to the peasant class, I've come to Little Woodham Living History Village to apprentice under the expert guidance of experimental archaeologist Caroline Nicolay. She's quickly got me dressing the part. First up on our roster of professions for medieval women is dairymaid. You want to be a dairymaid, you don't want to be a milkmaid. Okay. Milkmaids, you are out in the field the majority of the day, you are milking cows, big animals, usually surrounded by men working, showing elbows, oh. very bad reputation. Whereas the dairymaid has the softest hands because you always are very clean, cleanest of white linens you can possibly get, and you're always with cream, so butter, all these very nice natural fats, Ooh. and milk. So dairy made is actually quite good, and you can get really good wages. The Statute of Cambridge in 1388 shows that the average wage for women laborers and dairy maids in England was six shillings per year. That's about four shillings less than their male counterparts, but a wage nonetheless, even if equality was unheard of. And it was preferable to toiling in the fields. So the milkmaids milk the cows, mm -hmm. and when would you do that? About what time of day? Really early, first thing in the morning. You don't even get breakfast, you get dressed, go out, milk the cows. Okay. Come back in and let the milk run through various sieves or cloths to make sure there's no animal hair or dust, anything in the milk, mm -hmm. and you leave it to set. Once that's done, you will be able to separate the cream from the top of the milk, and you get your milk under there. Uh -huh. So the milk you can use to make the cheese, and the cream you can straight away use it to turn into butter. Making butter by hand is a surprisingly simple process, even for a total novice. So that's nice and warm now. Right. To make the butter, you need to agitate the cream. Ooh! Yeah. <laughs> it <laughs> feels like lotion or something it like really that. It does. And you have such soft hands afterwards. So there you go. Look, it's actually really getting very thick really quickly. I can't believe this. So we're kind of really getting it to come together in a nice thick paste. And just imagine coming in off the fields on a cold rainy day like this and just slathering a nice bit of butter all over some fresh bread. It's going to be amazing. And you are seconds away from butter because but the buttermilk will come out and you will feel it. Oh my gosh, no, I can sort of feel a liquid coming out of it now. There's the buttermilk. I'm blown away <laughs> by how even, you know, a desk girl like me was able to make butter this quickly, you know with a good teacher. As a peasant household, it made sense to have a daughter who was a good dairy maid. Even for a poorer family with just one cow, you'd still have enough milk to make butter, cream, and even cheese for your home. Mm. That's really good butter. This butter <laughs> is really good. Mm -hmm. Super creamy butter. Mm -hmm. I love it. But if I wanted to bring in actual money, I'd need to get more creative. A typical cash cottage industry was making cottage cheese, so long as you could get your hands on some salt and some acid, usually in the form of homemade vinegar. I prefer using cider vinegar or use crab apples to make verjuice, because okay. it has a nice light flavor, because mold vinegar from the ale is a bit oh, intense. Oh yeah, that's a lot, <laughs> yeah. We'll salt it and you need to over salt the milk. So to separate the cheese curds mm -hmm. from the whey that we don't want, the acid will do that. So you can pour a bit of vinegar, okay. give it a stir. Yeah, I can see immediately it's just curdling right up just in the minute it hit. Look at that. So you're done pretty much. That's wow, it. Wow, really? You have okay. The white curds on one side uh -huh. and the kind of yellowy way on yeah. the other side. I can see why this was a popular job for women. With the right resources, almost anyone could bake it. So it was a real cottage industry. That's why it's not uncommon for women merchants to appear in medieval records, especially businesswomen often appearing as cheesemongers. 
What do we need to go from a cheese like this to something that you would actually be able to sell at market? So once you have the cheese curds, you would get a clean cloth and you would put them in a cheese mold and you press it. So you add a weight on top of it. You would leave it to mature, to become a hard cheese. If you are dairying properly, you have so much milk to process every day. So you have a constant work. You get some cheese on the shelf that are matured, sell them at market. Some just replace them and they need to stay there for a while. And it just never ends. Wow. But just during the dairy season. So this is big business then. You've got women who are looking after 18 some cows. You've got staff who are in there looking after your cheese. You've got staff who are milking. You have real money that's kind of going around the place if you run a dairy. Business women. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Another highly skilled profession that medieval women are frequently recorded as working in is professional baking. Either making the whole loaf from scratch or just providing a baking service in special bread ovens. So that's what we're going to use today. Otherwise you would have to make your dough and bring it to the oven, to the baker. So you make the dough, they do the baking. And you pay them to do that. <sighs> So if you want to save money, you can bake on your fire, but you'd better not be caught because you're avoiding taxes, basically. Oh! Bread and dairy products were staples in every household, your literal bread and butter. So it makes sense that during the Middle Ages, this was serious business. Bakers' guilds were introduced to protect the interests of members and to regulate controls governing the price and weight of bread. And it could land you in some pretty hot water if you got things wrong or tried to cheat the system as happened to a crafty London pair called Alice de Brightenock and Lucy de Pickering. They were both bakers who were running a bit of a sneaky ruse. And what they would do is when someone brought in their loaf to be baked, someone from their house hid underneath the table and they made a secret hole inside the table and they would pinch off little bits of everybody's bread loaf. They would then combine all those bits of dough to make other loaves, which they would then offer for sale. They get caught doing this and there's a huge outcry. A bunch of men are caught as well. They're put in the stocks and the women are both sent to Newgate jail until all of the tables can be destroyed. So this seems like kind of a funny story and well, frankly it is, but they're literally stealing the bread out of their neighbor's mouths when they do this. It's incredibly dishonorable and basically they get in huge trouble for it. Cause you know, when someone is doing a bunch of manual labor like this, they expect to get the food at the end. Well, I noticed that our fire is dying down a little bit here. Do we need to build that back up? It basically is the end of the cooking day. So you would have to leave it to die down exactly like that mm -hmm. and use this. Oh. A curfew, a cover fire. Uh, it's come from couvre-feu. So curfews to stop the sparks going up the chimney because of course everything is made of thatch. And as houses are usually very close together, the whole neighborhood might just go up in flames. You would rake all your embers, put that on, and hope that tomorrow morning, when you remove it, you have some nice, lovely red embers so you can start your fire again. Managing a bread oven was a skilled business with a perpetual risk of the flames getting out of hand. Remember, the Great Fire of London famously began with a blaze starting at a baker's in the night. So we've got our bread, butter, and cheese, but I think I'm going to need something to wash it all down with. My favorite drink, beer. Brewing was frequently a female profession. Most women would make their own ale at home, but in the professional world, it remained largely feminized work as well. And ale houses and breweries were often run by women known as alewives. Now, this isn't women's work that was as accessible as being a dairy maid. A brewer with her own large scale brewery was probably one of the wealthier peasants. In fact, it was so lucrative that even members of the nobility sometimes got involved. And it was another industry that was heavily regulated with serious punishments for those who made a mistake or tried to skimp on ingredients. And like most professions in the Middle Ages, it was hot and sweaty business that wasn't without its risks. If you dig into the records, you can find evidence of women involved in accidents as well, such as Lady Juliana de Beauchamp. Her brewing business was profitable enough to employ several female assistants. Two of her brewing maids were carrying malt to put in a huge vat of boiling water in order to make commercial beer. 
One of them slipped and fell into the boiling water. The huge vat that they had been using to carry the malt in fell on top of her. They managed to pull her out, but she was scalded to death and she died really shortly thereafter. So while this seems kind of cute and a nice thing to do, it's also important to keep in mind that this is really dangerous. We're dealing with huge quantities of boiling water. You're dealing with really heavy things. So women are doing really dangerous work all the time. And that's pretty much it. So all the grain and all the, the bits that you don't want, in any case, in your beer are now in the cloth and a lot of the malt is left over in there. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Next step, I'm going to put that over the fire, leave it to boil. Mm -hmm. And if you had some, that's the point, you would actually add some flavorings to it. Gorse flowers mm -hmm. or heather, elderberries when it's in season. I don't like hops. I live in the late medieval England before hops becomes really a thing and it's mm -hmm. really, really bitter. We also see in the late medieval period, as a part of this, people writing pamphlets against the evils of adding hops to beer. Oh. They say it's a foreign and continental practice and that it leads to devilry. Ooh, devilry. <laughs> When that will have boiled or will be boiling, we bring it back, put it in another clean wooden tub and leave it to cool down. We'll add some balm, some yeast from a previous batch of ale and we'll leave it there just covered to begin to ferment. And as soon as it starts, in these. Right. You leave them open so the fermentation produces gas, it comes out. Uh, after, say, a couple of days, you can put the little tap on it, but leave it open. And after another day, maybe two, depending on the time of the year, normally you have fermented, so it means that the yeast will have eaten all the sugars from the malt and turned them into alcohol. You then have ale, you're fine. Well, I don't want to wait, but I suppose for ale, it's worth it. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.